So the first poem is called The Predator, Dr the Predator Drone. And um, it, um, I wrote it after hearing about um, that some of the drones that were used in Afghanistan are now being used along the border. Um, they're kind of getting a second life um, as eyes over the border. So this, this one is called the Predator Drone. The Predator Drone that hangs somewhere high above Highway 83 looks down on the century plant that has spread its candelabra flowers growing toward it like a hundred year lover. A mile up, the horror of internal fans ingests the clouds, takes in the land in all of its khaki monotony, where there should be a border, keeping all watchful desire to itself. So it's kind of a love story between a plant and a drone. Um, the second one is just kind of a random one, but it came out of watching a lot of horror movies on HBO when I was growing up. Called Any Horror Movie Worth Its Salt. Any horror movie worth its salt includes a symphony of flashlights that plays across the dark, a door no heroine should open, and that spot where the alien fell to Earth all those years ago, before there was a rating system or what happened to my face, turned to the switch plate right before love, that awful fuse blew out. <laughs> and um, they did all kinds of things to their house, including, including adding a, a shelf under their, their stairs and, and repainting the entire kitchen. But just um, the way with which capital and production can move in and just completely take over is, is, is kind of an inspiration for this one. It's called the Location Scout. The Location Scout wants to like your neighborhood. He walks its streets with an eye for how it will fit, fit lunch wagons, the reflectors, the portable generators, for how it will then look, flooded with a gigawatt sunshine, a roach scattering brilliance, making the concrete more actual, that discreet race of giants, the oaks and the pecans, more themselves. What the location scout sees is important because he reports to, to the director. The director who follows a spaghetti of cables to the star's trailers to talk them out of air-conditioned seclusion. When they emerge, everyone is glad. This is the very reason movies came to your home. Stars are the most down-to-earth people in the world. That is, until your dog breaks leash to chase the squirrel of your thoughts. Then it is all over. The shoot, done. Any chance you had for a cameo, shot. I don't know where this next one came from, um, but um, sometimes it's fun to kind of run with a first line and um, to see where it goes. And this is the way that this one developed. Um, and again, it moves more toward a story than a poem. And it's called, I Know Old Time Surfers Who. 
I know old time surfers who think the Beach Boys were the worst thing that ever happened, at least since returning from World War II, when they learned to ride a pipe while waiting to die in the Pacific Theater. One of them is my friend, Anders Kroger. Anders founded the ad agency that made a splash with an ad for California wine coolers in the late 1980s. His was one of those creative workplaces where the flush of new money commissioned a spiral slide in the atrium, and everyone kept vintage toys on their desks. Anders is a quiet guy, casual. The Hawaiian shirts are not an affectation. His cigarettes and puka shell bracelet, that too, not a pretension. It is the, re the relaxed and middle-aged despair of someone who saw things in Guadalcanal. Five of his wives never figured it out. I hate wine coolers, he laughs, before breaking into a cough. We made a fortune off of them, but give me a Tom fucking Collins any day. <laughs> the day I was with him out of Redondo, he stared out of the waves with bloodshot eyes. The Porsche idled behind us, parked on the shoulder as we looked down from the cliffs. Man, he said, a bit mistily. We used to pull abalone and lobster fresh from the sea. I mean, bonfires for days. Everybody hates. So this final one, uh, which I'm calling Blip, um, was the prologue to the original novel. And, um, My family, I guess, um, beginning with where the book began at that time, which was 1880, and my great grandfather in a town called Baghdad, Texas, which was just over the border uh, from Brownsville, um, and the rest of the time to explain it. Blip. Baghdad, at the Mexican tip of Texas, was where the Rio Grande opened its weedy mouth to the Gulf. Sleepy reed huts lined its shores, where the water lapped at fishing boats like a tidal lullaby. And the women, skinny or pear-shaped, sat outside those shacks in the dying light, telling dirty jokes, smoking their pipes, and mending nets. It was Las Mujeres who watched the ox carts start to arrive groaning with cotton and driven in teams by unshaven men crying out, Ay, mamacita! Celestina, mi vida! They laughed because men were ridiculous. <laughs> Soon, veils crowded the beach, extending out along the dim sickle curve of the shore for miles. This was because Baghdad did what Brownsville could not do, trade cotton with the rest of the world. Like a river of ants, the wagon trains streamed across the border while the federal gunboats could do nothing but watch. The tent city mushroomed in everyone, whites, blacks, Indians and mulattoes, Union and Confederate, whooped it up along the narrow streets in funny hats. Everyone dirty danced the wicked fandango. And then a hurricane wheeled in from the Gulf and wiped it all off the map. Blip. Adios. No more signal fires winking along the South Padre dunes. No more British ships bobbing off shores like burgers, waiting to exchange plantation coffee and regimental gin. Gone. It was all gone. Skiffs and grog shops, whorehouses and stores, teamsters cracking whips and the forest of ship masts gently tilting against each other as far out as the eye could see. Ni mas, ni modo, bueno by, nothing left behind but splintered wood and shifted sandbars. Not so much as a stupid accounting ledger left, drifting to shore with a brainless jellyfish. It figures, South Texas creates its own rolling amnesia. 
From the beginning, the land sold the family. Expect occasional annihilation. Live along borders only God can erase. Yak, what am I thinking? Go to sleep. Bogged down with the humidity on coastal flats. Dwell under miles of blanched sky where the sound of your own mind can swallow you whole. Never mind the massive amount of bad faith which will hover like an unspoken barometric inversion over Anglos and Mexicans for the next 100 years. Today, the oil platforms stand offshore like distant beasts. Medical garbage washes in along South Padre, and brown pelicans groan over the erasing surf. Only the quaint translates north of San Antonio anyway. anyway. Mamacita, Virgencita, Boteria, corn. So go ahead, write the place in primary colors. Hoe it along in simple declarative sentences, one that stay like good little gardeners in the regional. Then seal it off, then seal off the cute little barrio like a borderland snow globe, shaken with mild curiosity on the desk of an editor in New York. And that's that piece of sweetness. <laughs> yeah. Thank you.